grace greater than all my sin. So one of the things that we promised was that we would say, what if you were new to the faith? What if you were brand new and we had to do kind of 101? This is what it means to be a Christian. So I want to break this down to you as simple as I can by starting to just reveal who I am. I, as your pastor, am always frustrated that I'm not enough. I don't know if you live there, but I never feel like I'm a good enough dad. There's always more I wish I had done for the kids. When I'm working, I wish I was working and, and doing more with the kids. When I'm doing this, I think, oh, I should be doing work. And there's never enough of me to go around. In my battles of temptation, I'm constantly staring at the next thing that's dragging me down, that's calling my mind away from Jesus, and I don't feel like I'm strong enough to resist certain things. I feel like in my relationship with my wife, I'm not a good enough husband, that, that she deserves better, that she deserves more, that I should be doing more to help her experience the love that I want her to have, that I feel incapable of expressing. When it comes to the church, there's a, a thousand things that could be, should be done, and I never feel like there's enough pastor to go around. There's more people that are saying, hey, would you come visit me? Would you come do this? And I want to do that, and, and I never feel like there's enough. And there's, there's always somewhere where there's a huge need. And I never feel like I'm praying enough. I never feel like I'm reading the Bible enough. I never feel like I'm studying enough. I never feel like I'm caring for you enough. It's just not enough. And I'm willing to bet that I'm not the only one in the room who goes, I just don't feel like I'm ever enough. Anybody feel that way? Man, it's like a disease and it's inside us that robs our joy, that takes everything we have and says, I want you to live in a sense of depression, in a sense of anxiety, in a sense of overwhelmingness that, 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 that you're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be smart enough. You're never going to be rich enough. You're, never gonna, you're just not enough. And then at the end of the day, we go to bed and there's what? Not enough sleep. And I wake up and then I do it all again. What a vicious, vicious cycle. Now, here's what I want you to know. That is not how God intends for us to live. But before we get to how God intends for us to live, I just want to confess to you that I struggle to live into grace. And so I just want to say it because as we move through this entire series, there's going to be some of you who are gathered who are like me, who go, I kind of understand God's grace, but I'm really working to live into it because it's just a, a, a gift that is so amazing and so free and so just freeing that I'm like, I don't know how to do this because it's contrary to everything that you and I are taught, everything that you and I learned from the day we were born. If you wanted it, you had to, wow, you knew the answer. We train you in school to say, hey, you didn't earn that grade, or at least we used to. I don't know if we do anymore. But we, we, we say, if you didn't earn that grade, you don't get it. If you didn't earn your playing time, you couldn't play. If you didn't earn your spot on the team, you didn't make the team. If you didn't show up at work and do your job and earn it, you don't get a paycheck. And some of us have broken relationships where if we didn't behave correctly, we weren't earning love. And our whole life has been conditioned to earn it to in essence be enough and you and I go to bed every night wondering if we're going to be enough and I just want to introduce you to a concept called grace that says if you feel that way you're doing okay step one I want to make sure that you heard that right if you feel like you're not enough good for you because if you feel like maybe you're enough you don't need God. In fact, if you feel like you got your life together, you're probably going to go and listen to a, hey, personal investment or personal improvement talk and come out of there all fired up going, I have the answers inside me. I can be enough. I can do enough. I am the next Savior. But if you live going, I'm not enough, that's step one of grace. It's step one of discipleship going, I need Jesus because I'm a mess. In fact, I can't do it on my own. Every time I try to do it on my own, every time I try to take steps on my own, I feel like I'm actually walking the wrong way. I'm going against what I want. And here's the good news, is that your grace of God, the grace of God is greater not only than all my sin, but all my attempts to be enough. And this is why this is so challenging, so countercultural, so brand new, all right, is that Jesus says, you can't be enough, but I am, and I give my life to you. Amen?
And then he calls us to do something more radical than anything we've seen. And this is why grace is hard to live into. It's because he says, I want you to have a healthy, intimate, passionate, growing relationship with me. And then you and I try to earn it. Why? Because that's the way the world works. And then it messes it all up, right? No, no, Jesus, I'm doing all this for you. And he's like, I don't want you to do anything for me. In fact, your, your efforts, your energies, they don't really impact me. I just want you to enjoy the relationship. No, 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 Jesus, I, I got to figure out. Let me tell you how it works, Jesus. You ever do that? Let me tell you how it works, Jesus. I'm going to start doing, I'm going to be better. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to start doing this. I, I'm going to set up a Bible reading plan where I read through the entire Bible in a week, every week. And we start going through all the things we're going to do and all the changes and all the things we stop doing. And by the time we're done with it, God's coming. Kind of, everything that you're trying to do is going to drive you further away from me. Because it's going to be about a week before you figure out you can't do it because you can't be enough. I just want you to enjoy my relationship. Wait, wait, Jesus, I I know what you mean. I know you want me to to sing more at church. You want me to get more involved in church. You want me to do more. No, no, no. I just want you to enjoy the relationship. What do I got to do to to help you feel and make myself feel more loved? Really, what all do I have to do? I want you to hear how broken you are and how broken you sound. I just want you to enjoy the relationship. The relationship is the gift of grace. When I created humanity in the garden, you weren't meant to feel any of these negative emotions. The only thing I created you to experience was the goodness of God. And if you remember the stories that I've told you, I showed up and I walked with Adam and Eve and we hung out and there was complete intimacy between us. That's all I want for you to experience. Jesus, but what about all those good things? What about all the the things that I'm supposed to do? There's needs, there's people I should talk to and there's things I'm supposed to do. Let me just explain this to you. Those are outworkings of love, not ways to earn love you know the difference they're outworkings of love not ways to earn love my father always tells the story that when he was younger he had to take out the garbage any garbage taker outers good i see a lot of men doing that it's a manly job take out the garbage right plunge toilets take out garbage that's a man's work right here's what i want you to know he hated it he talks about what a chore it was. I got to take out the garbage. And mom and dad would have to yell at him. My grandma and grandpa would have to yell at him. He'd finally take it out after a, a fight with himself and with them. He says, and I got married to your mother. And he goes, suddenly the garbage. I woke up one day and I was like, I get to take out the garbage because I love your mother. It's an outworking of a healthy, intimate, passionate, growing relationship. Everybody with me so far? So today I just want to make clear, if you've been trying to earn God's love, earn God's affection, you've been trying to be enough, you can't be enough. In fact, if you come to the point where you realize, I don't have the answers inside me, I'm not enough, you've done step one correctly, you need Jesus. Now we move forward. What I want to do is I want to take just a moment, again, because I wanted to 101 this, I wanted to clarify a few things. Here's a timeline of a person's relationship status with Jesus. So it starts out with the kindness of God draws us to himself. Did you know that God never wants to beat you up to draw you near him? In fact, the hardships that we go through, if you look, most of those things are actually self-created, right? I made these dumb decisions, and I had to live with this guilt, and I had to live with this frustration. Yes, there are external things, there are sicknesses, there are accidents that happen, but most of the internal struggles that we have with God are a result of our own behavior. And here's what I want you to know. God loves you enough to pursue you, and it is the kindness of God, forbearance of God, the patience of God that leads us to, and then you see that key word? Repentance. And that repentance part is that part where we go, I'm not enough and I can't fix it and I've been messing it up and God, just take this mess. And I'm coming to you because you continue to love. You continue to be kind. Step two, we repent of our sins. We surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. Peter says to the church in Acts 2 when it's starting, they go, what should we do now? We've heard the message. He goes, repent. All right? And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Step three, all right, accept the gift of new birth. Remember this guy named Nicodemus in John 3 says, hey, what do I have to do to inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus says, be born again. He's like, I can't get back into my mom's womb. What are you talking about? And Jesus is like, don't 
He literally Homer Simpson him. And he said, no, that's not what we mean. We're not, it's being born of the Spirit. And we celebrate that through a baptism, right? It's an act of grace that that old messed up life was buried and died on the cross with Jesus, and you get a new life. And then finally, every day you're being, when we use this word sanctified, it's discipleship step number five. If you are part of the, the group that already has went through the class, all right, it is the sanctifying of grace. It is where God makes us holy. And I just, I need to sit here for a second. I need you to see that. It's where God makes us holy. It's where God makes us holy. Say it with me. It's where God makes us holy. Because this is where we mess it up as Christians. We go, this is where I make myself holy. And guess what? We've already screwed up then. The whole process. Right, God? I want you to just enjoy the relationship. I'm going to change everything about you. I'm making you holy. You can't do it anyways. Something dirty can't make something holy. Right? person with muddy hands can't clean the window right only God can make us holy so it's where God is making us holy and so again often this is the step where we mess it up and we go God I'm going to make myself holy today I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to stop doing it and God's like oh let's go back to step one why because when you start making yourself holy guess what you realize you're not enough feet recycle rinse right and the goal of sanctification is where God makes us holy. God is doing the work, not you and I. So what is grace? To show grace is to extend favor or kindness to one who doesn't deserve it and can't earn it. You ever show grace to anybody? If you're a husband and you're married, your answer should have been yes. I receive it and I know it. All the time. Wives, you are a great giver of grace, right? Receiving the acceptance by grace stands in sharp contrast with the earning it, all right? And every time grace appears, we have to go, I didn't deserve that. Every time someone says, I actually love you, and you and I go, you shouldn't love me because your brain should then click to the next file folder and go, what an act of grace. Not, no, I don't deserve it. You can't love me. We should actually click to the next file and go, I don't deserve it. That's because it's a gift of grace, right? Favor is being extended out of the heart of another. Understanding grace, actually, I love the Hebrew word, all right? It means to bend, to stoop down. And the idea of this is that I want you to think of, of old England. You got old England in mind, and here was royalty, and they're walking the streets, all right? And here's the peasant coming up, and they say to the king or queen, oh, king or queen, you're so great. Would, would you bless me? Would you give me a piece of bread? And the king stops. Does the king need to stop? Is the king required to stop? No. The king stops, gets out of the cart or gets off his horse, stoops down to the peasant and says, I bless you, and it gives him a gift. If we understand grace, the idea of the king of all creation stooping down to earth, by the way, we call that Christmas, to show us his love. That's grace. I'm not big into an acronyms because I can't spell, I think. But here's one with grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a good way to remember it. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Now, before we get into the Scripture, I just want to stop and give you two ways that we mess up grace. All right? We've already talked about it a bit. The first one is, is that we have to earn it, and grace becomes works. Some of you have heard us say that salvation is by faith alone. Ephesians 2, the salvation is by faith alone. Salvation is by faith alone, by trusting in God alone. That is an act of grace. Here's what we do then. We go, salvation is by faith alone, and anytime we put an and in there, we mess it up. And my good works, and by doing this, and I have to and, and if you have an and, after salvation is by faith alone, you suddenly are no longer a Christian. You're part of another religion. And by the way, this is what makes Christianity, at least one of the things that makes Christianity unique, is that there are no ands. If you are part of the church of Latter-day Saints or the Mormon church, you have to, salvation is by faith and, and there's a list of things you have to do. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, it's salvation is by Jesus and, and there's a list you have to do. And by the way, Jesus isn't the same Jesus you and I know. Salvation in every other religion is a matter of works, and this is what makes Christianity so unique and so difficult is because it strips you and I of all the power and all the glory, and it goes to the one that it be belongs to, the one who deserves it, and that is Jesus. 
right? But you and I don't get to claim any part of it. If you're earning grace, here's a little note from one of my favorite theologians, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says, uh, if you're earning grace, that's cheap grace. The other side of that is cheap grace forgives sins, which frees us from the toils of sins. But cheap grace is grace we bestow upon ourselves. And this is the idea. Cheap grace doesn't require any transformation or change. Cheap grace just says, I accept you as you are. You look good. Nice to meet you. Let's move on. Does that make sense? So cheap grace is grace that we bestow on ourselves. It's preaching without forgiveness. It is the requiring without repentance or baptism. It is communion without faith. All right, on confession, it is the discipleship that says you don't have to change at all who you are. Just stay exactly as you are. That's cheap grace. Let me help you with a little imagery that I like. All right, imagine you're in a hole. You're in a hole. You're not enough. You're in a hole. You're in trouble. You can't get out of the hole. All right, here's what we get at a bar. Here's what most of us and all the farther we get. And here's, by the way, what the world says they want from the church. And this is why we're in constant conflict. You walk by. You're in the hole, Jesus, or excuse me, someone who accepts you says, you're in a hole. You look up to him like, I'm well aware I'm in a hole. Now, pause, because those of us who are still saying, I'm not enough, but I'm working at it. I'm going to be enough. The answers are inside. You don't know you're in a hole. You have friends right now who are in a hole. They don't know it, because what? They're going to be enough. The answers are inside them. They're going to be good enough one day, right? They're burning out. They just don't know it yet. And you're like, you're in a hole. And they're like, no, I'm not. I got it figured out. I just got to keep working harder, right? Here's acceptance. Acceptance says you're in a hole. Just, just wanted to make sure you knew. Sorry, you're in a hole. And acceptance leaves. That's what you get at the bar. Oh, man, my wife left me. My dog's dead. You sing the country song, right? And the person beside you goes, that sounds terrible, man. I love you. Puts his arm around you. Nothing changes. There are no solutions. Here's what Jesus does. This is what grace does. Jesus says, hey, you're in a hole. Sometimes he has to convince us that we're in a hole. And it, just as what Jesus does, he actually stops and says, I just want you to know I'll sit and wait until you recognize you're in a hole. And when you're ready to see that, I want you to know I have grace that will get you out of there. And eventually we go, oh, I'm ready to get out. And Jesus goes, oh, I'm going to climb down in. And you're like, no, wait. And Jesus jumps down in. And you're like, great, now we're both in the hole. I couldn't get out. And now you're in here with me. And Jesus goes, I know, but you're going to. I'm going to take your place. Just stand on my shoulders and you can get out. What about you, Jesus? I'm going to stay here in the hole and take your place. Well, Jesus, that's not fair. Jesus goes, I know. It's grace. I love you this much. You see, grace never leaves us as we are. That's why to follow Jesus, we have to invest in the relationship. But when we invest in the relationship, we experience the love of God. It's Jesus' kindness leads us to change. Amen? All right, I want to take you to one of my favorite stories out of the Gospel of John. If you've got a Bible, you want to go there with me? If you have your Bible or your app open, just real quick, I don't want to spend a lot of time. If you have a question, we come back later and, and work on this. But you may see a little line that says, hey, this story was not in all the earliest documents. It was only in some of them. So there's like five earliest documents, and it's in two out of the three and one of them is actually in Luke. And so stories that were collected and written that we have from 200 to 500 A.D., one of those earliest documents that we use to compile the Scriptures, this story wasn't in this place in John and all of them, but it was in two of the three, and in another one it was in the Gospel of Luke. And so here's just what I want you to know. Your Bible says, hey, we just want you to know this. We're so concerned about keeping the scripture sacred we just wanted you to know that and i've heard people say well i don't know if this is a story of jesus and i go it's such a bizarre bizarre story it has to be a story of jesus all right it's such a unique story it has to be a story of jesus and it's so consistent with who jesus is i buy it why because jesus doesn't do what would be done if we were making up a story about a hero, and it's so early that I believe it's consistent with all the scriptures. So I'm going to give you that. Just know that I trust it. We can talk about it later and talk about whether or not you buy into it or not. But here's the story. John 8, verse 1, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So that's our setting, the Mount of Olives, looking down on Jerusalem. At dawn, he appears again at the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach. So there's Jesus sitting down. 
There's a group of people around the Mount of Olives. There he is teaching. All right, and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees are out to get him, as always. There's the villain coming in, right? And here's what happens. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees bring a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before our group and said to Jesus, Teacher! You've got to say it with an angry voice. If you don't say it with an angry voice, you're not reading it. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. There we go. Now, pause. Before we get any further, what you need to know is that it's really odd that there's no male caught in the act of adultery. Just saying this is all set up. So everybody who wasn't involved in the emotion of the story at the time was probably looking going, this looks a little not right. Now, I'm not saying that the woman wasn't committing adultery because by the end of the passage, we see that clearly she probably was. But we can't have a proper court case because you can't have adultery with one person, right? So I'm just saying already you should be like, sketchy, right? Something's up here, right? So they bring the woman caught in the act of adultery, and here's what happens. The law of Moses commands us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say, Jesus? And they were using the question to trap him in order to have a basis for accusing him. Now, you see the trap? The law of Moses says we should stone this lady because she was caught in the act of adultery. So if Jesus said, no, 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 we're not going to do that, he's violating the law of Moses, which means he's probably not a prophet. But the Roman law says that the Jews don't have the authority to actually carry out capital punishment. And so if Jesus says, well, we have to obey the law of Rome, all right, or excuse me, we have to stone her, that means they're disobeying the law of Rome, and now he's going against the government. So he's either going against the law of Moses or going against the government. They've got him in a catch-22. Everybody see the catch-22? The rock in the hard place, right? Now, I just, real quick, I don't want to spend too much time on it, although it's one of my favorite demonstrations. I just want you to understand the whole stoning process because if you don't understand the stoning process, you miss what the woman's feeling, all right? And here's how this works. They drag the woman, all right, in front of the court. There's supposed to be a court hearing. You have to have multiple witnesses, all right? And here's again where I just go, this court's shaky because who are the witnesses, all right? All they say is she was caught in the act of adultery. You have to have two or more witnesses, and this is what happens. Those two witnesses, once she's caught in the act of adultery, once she's been accused, once she's found guilty, they drag her out of the city. You don't kill people in the city. They drag them out of the city. They get a cliff. Now, there's all kinds of rules on how to kill people. It's actually right fascinating if you study some of this and go, well, there's a whole process to make sure that the stoning is done correctly because no one wanted to be guilty of murdering someone that was an innocent person. So they take the woman out to a hill. They stand at the hill. It's supposed to have at least a 20-foot drop there, right? And so here's the woman and the entire group. And back in the courts, all right, in the city, there's a rider on a horse, all right, who is supposed to be part of the actual court case in case there's a witness that comes forth at the last minute. Right? And there's a person that comes out on foot, and he says, hey, there's no more witnesses. She's been found guilty. You can go ahead with the stoning. Now, the rider on the horse back at the temple area is supposed to be there in case there is a witness that comes forth because he's got to get out there fast to stop the stoning. Right? So once we declare she's guilty, whoever it is, and again, remember, Stephen is one of the first people the church stoned, so this is not just something that happens to ladies. All right, they take the woman. They throw her off the cliff. She may or may not be bound. He may or may not be bound. In this case, it's a woman. They throw them off the cliff. Now, it's a 20-foot drop. Now, at that point in time, they may die. Done. Sentence carried out. Nobody needs to do anything, right? But if he or she doesn't die, again, in this case, it's a she. If he or she doesn't die, the person who made the accusations, the persons, there has to be at least two or more, all right, is the one who has to throw the first stone. Why? Because they're the ones who the guilt of killing that person will be on if they're lying or we've made a mistake. Now, think about that. The person who makes the accusation has to have a stone. Now, I brought a stone in, and again, there's rules about what type of stone you have to have. You have to have a stone that's bigger than your head. That's part of the rules, so stoning. All right? You have to have a stone that's bigger than your head. It's supposed to weigh around 15 to 20 pounds. Now, no one was out measuring these things or weighing them, but the point was you aren't throwing pebbles at someone. When you study this, and you're like, oh, how big does the stone have to be? Well, we wanted a stone that might kill the person, right? And so the accuser now takes the stone. He has to stand over the cliff. Now, again, there's a really amazing laws around this. He can't baseball throw this stone, part because it weighs so much. Right? The person 
They'll drag the body back up to the edge of the cliff if it fell away. That person who's standing there waiting to be killed, probably already severely injured. Now to stone them, I have to hold the stone out at chest length and drop it on that person's head. That's how that works. That's the whole stoning process. Did I kill her? Nope. Remember the second person who had to be there as a witness? Now they do the same thing. They have to hold it out chest length and just drop it. All right? And then the entire community is to be involved. And so everybody brings their stone, and the entire community is ready now to start hurling until this person is dead. Everybody with the process? Now, and it's important for us to know that simply because there's a lady in front of Jesus who's accused of adultery, who is waiting to be stoned, and she knows the process. She knows what's about to happen. So if you want to crawl into the story, you've got to imagine it. Hey, she's totally scared to death, not just because she's going to die, but because this is not a fun way to go. Amen? On my top ten list, it's in Make It. Right? And so it's an entire emotional scene that we have to crawl into. Right, verse 6, so they've accused, they put Jesus in the trap, and then what's Jesus do? It says that Jesus bent down, and he started writing with his finger on the ground. Jesus really does some odd things at times. Now, I want you to see a couple things. First off, get the picture. Here's everybody with stones. They haven't actually gotten outside the city uh, to where they're going to be, but they're on the Mount of Olives, so they can kill her probably on the other side of the Mount of Olives. And so they're all standing there with the stones, and they're ready like, Jesus, what should we do? Should we stone her? And they're all ready to go, and there's the lady, and she's weeping, and she's probably on her knees by now, and there's everybody ready to go, and they're ready to go, and there's a whole crowd, and they're ready to go. And Jesus does drawings in the sand. How heavy is the rock? 15 to 20 pounds. How long do I want to hold that? Not very long, right? By the way, we have a mob with us, right? You ever, ever hear something called mob mentality? It's when your brain switches off. Today they call it you go into caveman brain. Sometimes you don't even know why you're following the crowd. You just knew there was a crowd, there was excitement, and you followed it. You're not thinking logically. You're like, yeah, we should all be angry. We're all going to grab stones. Why are we stoning her? I don't know, but we're all going to go. Let's get her. And they all show up, and they're ready there with all that energy. Jesus starts riding in the dirt. He's so brilliant. The best way to diffuse the energy of a mob is to invite the mob to stop and think. We do this to our kids, right? Just, oh, slow slow down. I want you to think. Because I bet if you slow down and you think, you'll see maybe you're not making the wisest decision, right? So there's everybody waiting. And here's what you got to see. The first guy, he's kind of leading the charge, and he's like, what's he doing? I don't know. I think he's writing on the ground. Why is he writing on the ground? I don't know. What's he writing? I don't know. I can't see. What are we going to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Hey, you're supposed to be in charge. What? Tell Jesus we're ready to stone him. We need a decision. Peter's like, I don't know. Jesus, they want a decision. He's not answering. I don't know what, how, are we going to get an answer or not? I don't, I, listen, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how long it goes on, but I'm imagining there's like five, ten minutes. And people got these stones, and they're getting heavier. And Jesus finally, all right, finally says to them something radically different. Before we get there, I want you to hear this. This is an amazing quote, all right? I I just want to give this to you as a gift. You can't administer proper justice until you administer proper grace. Listen, there are moments where we're called to judge. That's actually in Scripture. We should judge behavior. I know you've heard people say, you shouldn't judge. Well, that's not scriptural. Right? In fact, you judge every day. When you tell your child, you can't put the cat in a microwave, that's wrong behavior. That's a judgment. You can't play in the street. That's wrong behavior. That's a judgment. Right? He should not have cut in line. That's wrong behavior. That's a judgment. You can't take that person's money. That's a judgment. We are called to judge, but you can't judge properly until you first administered grace. That's why God is the ultimate judge. Because God administers grace. Listen, if you want to find something that changes how you behave and you're a critical thinker of people at times, just put that in the back of your head, tattoo it on your arm, and every time that criticism starts to come up, you should stop and go, I can't administer proper judgment until I first administer grace. And people will be like, are you looking at your watch? Yes, that's what I'm doing. You're just talking to God and saying a little prayer. I can't administer proper judgment until I first administer grace. All right, so here's what happens. Jesus is starting to ride on the ground. At this, those who heard began to, excuse me, we missed a verse there. There we go. All right? Love that goes upward, all right, is worship. Love that goes outward is affection. Love that stoops is grace. My clicker is going too fast. There we go. Come on, get back. 
All right, just stay with me. This is the story. You ready? Jesus says this. As he's riding on the ground, he says this phrase. He says, hey, let the person who has no sin throw the first stone. Did you say Jesus? in here? Let the person who has no sin throw the first stone. And then Jesus goes back to riding on the ground. And I love the image. As everybody's standing around, you see the scripture actually says the oldest, the wisest, dropped their stones first, recognizing that they they weren't perfect because they hadn't at first administered grace before judgment, right? And so the oldest dropped their stones, and they began to go away one at a time until only the woman was left standing out. This is the part of the story that we want to just skip over because we're like, oh, Jesus saved the woman. But I want you to see the tension in the story that's still there. But the person without the sin throw the first stone. The woman, Jesus, and probably the disciples and a few other onlookers are left. Is there anybody left who can throw a stone? The answer is yes. Remember, Jesus said, let the person who is without sin throw the first stone. Who's left? Jesus, the only being ever without sin, is left. So the woman's not free. In fact, she's there before the judge of all creation. One day, we will all stand before Jesus and be judged. So the woman is there with the only person in the universe who's like, yeah, I'm without sin, so I can still get you. By the way, it's my law. The only person left who can throw the first stone is riding on the ground you got to love the tension of the story. This is where I think the story actually gets really good, right? There's only one person left to condemn the woman. There's only one person left to carry out the sentence. There's only one person left who can say, all right, justice is required. I'm Batman. Just saying that's how it works in my head. All right, here's what happens, all right? Jesus straightens up, and he asks her, woman, where are they? Jesus knows where they're at. But Jesus is asking if she heard what happened. Because why? He wants to set her free of her past so that she can live into grace and a relationship with him. Jesus isn't like, woman, where'd everybody go? I've been so busy drawing, I didn't pay attention. That's not what's going on. He says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She says, no, sir. Then he says, then neither do I. Go now and leave your life of sin. If you have your Bible, if you have your app open, you need to circle these two places. You need to underline them. You need to dance on them tomorrow. I want you to see this. This is the power of grace and the Scripture. Right here it is. Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you. Why? Because that's the act of grace. You're not getting what you deserve. What you and I deserve is hell. But Jesus says, I took your place in the hole. I traded spots with you. And so I don't condemn you. I've set you free. That's grace, number one in the story. But remember, we also said grace is transformative. It doesn't leave you are as you are. Jesus doesn't see this woman broken, needy, a train wreck, all right? She didn't one day grow up in fourth grade go, I want to be an adulteress, right? Jesus doesn't leave her as she is. She says to her, what? Then leave your life of sin. It's an invitation to start over in the relationship with God. That's the second moment of grace. It's the same two grace moments Jesus gives to every one of us. Number one, I took your place. I set you free. I don't condemn you. Number two, but I don't want you to be the mess that you are. I've created you for more. Let's live life different. Let's live life by having a healthy, intimate, passionate, growing relationship with Jesus. Let's live life the way I designed it.